Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail. The realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story Possible Wendigo Encounter First Time Poster Long Time Lurker For some context, I live in Jersey in a somewhat wooded area by the bay. There is a small patch of woods that separates my house from the home behind us that you can easily see through to their backyard and our neighbor on both sides have fences. The one on the left has a full fence that spans the length of the property and the neighbors on the right have a fence that goes down halfway the property so you can see into their backyard. We have never had any issues with the wildlife aside from some coyotes in the area, but they have never entered our property. I usually have to leave early in the morning before the sun comes up, and this particular morning was no different. I walked out to my car and heard what I thought was my next door neighbor which I found odd as I've never heard them awake this early. Before I entered my car I heard a noise that sounded like my neighbor saying, Hey, coming from the right side of our backyard I turn my head to look and I see two glowing eyes looking back at me. I could tell it was tall but I couldn't make out any other details, but I knew it wasn't human. I never lost eye contact with it until I got in my car. I tried to pull my car so the headlights could shine on what I saw, but it was gone. Now, every time I go out to my car at night or early in the morning, I hear strange noises coming from the woods around my house. Some of the noises sound exactly like small children. I'm not sure what I encountered, but it scared the hell out of me. Second story. Something's not right with the deer. Me and my girlfriend's vacation in the woods had been progressing phenomenally well up until the second morning of our stay, when I stepped out of the cabin to take a leak, only to be greeted by two very, very still deer staring right at me from the nearby shrubbery, still groggy from the night before. I ignored the two and waddled clumsily to a bush on the other side of the clearing, away from where they stood. As I was relieving myself, I heard Sam calling out from inside, asking why I left the door open. I pulled my boxers back on and turned around swiftly, almost butting heads with one of the deer who now stood mere inches away from me. For a moment, I thought I was going to get a heart attack, but I didn't so I don't think I ever will. I fell on my ass as the animal kept looking at me with a dumbfounded look on its face. Having had ample experience with deer up close and personal, I can tell you that I've never seen one that stared quite the same as this one did. It was also eerily quiet, as it snuck up on me without so much as a sound. I got back up without letting it out of my sight and rushed into the cabin, where the second deer stood right at the doorway. What the hell is going on with this thing? said Sam, petting the deer awkwardly over its head. I think they're sick. Don't touch them anymore. She pulled her hand away instantly and took a step back. One of them tried sneaking up on me, almost scared me to death, I said. The deer kept staring at Sam even as I pushed it aside to enter the cabin. It tried to do the same but I slapped it lightly across the muzzle, which made it stop in its tracks. Sam looked at me with a confused look in her eye. Come on, Jordan. Get the poor thing back outside while I get dressed. As I was scratching my head, thinking of what to do, the bastard that scared the hell out of me stepped closer to the cabin, and both of the deer were now staring directly at me, which was uncanny, to say the least. I noticed that they both had strange, hump-like growth set between their shoulder blades, but simply wrote it off as something to do with their condition. I grabbed a broom and gently pushed the nearest animal out, which disrupted its balance and forced it to step back a few, after which I could close the door without harming it. Proud of myself for defusing a potentially hazardous situation, I decided to get a cold one and maybe Google around and inform myself about deer diseases. Just in case. Sam and I spent the rest of the morning huddled in the cabin, 
watching Guardians of the Galaxy on my laptop. After having lunch, we decided to take a walk around the woods before nightfall. We both packed our backpacks, and I instinctively grabbed my .45 as well, which hadn't left my side ever since I returned from Iraq a couple of years back. I half expected the strange animals to still be lumbering around our cabin, but was relieved to see that they had dragged their butts off to somewhere else. Sam didn't say anything, but I'm sure she had felt the same. We walked westward for about an hour when we reached a small, rather picturesque creek, where Sam wanted us to take a break for a bit. Just as we settled down and lowered our packs, I heard a rustle some twenty feet away from where we were. What is it? What happened? A deep feeling of unease washed over me. The woods no longer looked serene and beautiful but ominous and menacing. Come on, talk to me, Jordan, Sam insisted. I think we should pack up and get back to the cabin. Her brow had crumpled with worry and she silently agreed, immediately moving to get her stuff. At the same time, I kept an eye on the shrub from which the rustling had come. Just as Sam had finished packing, a deer stooped out from behind a tree to my right. Another reared its head from the shrub as the source of the rustle. The jitters I felt soon turned into sheer dread. As I saw another coming from behind us, and about five more promenading slowly out of the deep woods, there was something wrong with their gait with the way they carry themselves, something I still can't properly define. It was off in any case, and Sam was by then practically pulling my sleeve for us to get back from where we came. I didn't need any further inclination before turning around and moving steadfastly to the cabin. We returned without any further incidents, but the animals kept following us in impossible unison. Imagine a cat's curiosity amped up to eleven, that's what those deer acted like, except way creepier. When we saw the cabin, Sam started jogging to the door to unlock it as soon as possible, when a young doe came out of nowhere and rammed her from the side. She fell down and yelped in pain, and I expected the animal to run away, but it didn't. Instead, it sprawled itself on top of Sam, pinning her down as the rest of the herd came rushing stiffly toward her. I was faster, though, and I pulled the damn thing off Sam and jerked it off to the side. In that moment, I didn't have the time to pick my girlfriend up and get us safely into the cabin, so I pulled out my handgun and fired a shot into the ground in front of the misshapen horde. There were now over a dozen, and they all stopped in perfect unison. Can you walk? She nodded, asking me to help her up. Her shoulder looked to be dislocated, so I nudged her softly toward the cabin while pointing my firearm at the animals. Something's very wrong with these things, Jordan. We need to leave. As we were entering the cabin, I heard a strange clicking sound coming from the deer. Like when someone clicks their tongue, they kept doing it over and over again, all the while staring at me menacingly. I shut the door and turned the key hasting immediately towards Sam to try and get her shoulder in working order. A crack and a scream later, she was as good as new. We moved to the bedroom to pack our stuff and get the hell out of there but somehow fell asleep along the way. I woke up almost 12 hours later, at 0100, to the sound of something hitting the front door. Thump, 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 thump. Sam, get up, I whispered shaking her, Sam. She wouldn't budge. I checked her breathing and pulse. She was fine. But whatever was out there wasn't letting up. I grabbed my phone and called the cops, told them that there was someone trying to force their way into our cabin. Naturally, I left out the finer details of our predicament. They told me they'd be there in 20 minutes, which would have been fine if there wasn't something trying to force its way inside. The hinges were already letting up under force. Tucking the .45 in my pants, I jumped to try and move the heavy wardrobe over the door, which I managed just in time for it to stop the thing from forcing its way through. 
That's when another round of clicking started. And this time, I could clearly hear interspersed whistling as well. I dared to take a look out the tiny window from the living room only to see dozens of deer all huddled around our place, all clicking their tongues wildly. To say that I was terrified would be a severe understatement. I turned to check on Sam when I noticed a thin, leathery strand hovering right above her. It was displaced entirely, coiling in a way I could never have imagined before witnessing it myself. Like a snake, it poked and probed her skin, as if looking for a way in. Without thinking, I leaped onto the bed in an attempt to chase the thing away, and when I took note of where it came from, I felt as if the ground had given way under my feet. I've tried to describe what I saw as the source of the strand both verbally and on paper more than once, but I can't. Impossible to explain. Whatever the thing was, I took aim and fired a round, which then coiled and twisted itself, just as the strand did. After a few moments, it hit something, and when that happened, all the clicking and whistling stopped in an instant. When the cops arrived, they saw over 60 dead deer flopped outside our cabin, as well as one absolutely huge moose, which was the thing ramming the door. Cause of death? Massive internal organ failure. Also worth mentioning is that hay all had strange, pus-filled lumps I noticed on the very first deer to have visited us. Sam is now fine. Toxicology reports said that we had both been lulled to sleep using a drug of some sort, which was administered directly into our bloodstreams, somehow. Thankfully, it didn't hit me nearly as hard as it hit her. This all happened last month, and Sam and I were being dragged around various government facilities for quite some time since. Nothing too unpleasant, though I can attest to Uncle Sam being very thorough when it comes to physical examinations. We still don't fully understand what happened to us and what was wrong with the deer, but I have good reason to believe that this wasn't an isolated case, and here's why. While we were being treated like guinea pigs, there was this one offshore lab where numerous other people were being tested on as well, and though we weren't really allowed to communicate with them nor get too close, I noticed something about a few of them, a small, discreet lump located at the nape of their necks, I hope it wasn't what I think it was. Be careful out there. Third story. I will never go deer hunting again. My favorite place to visit when I was a kid was my grandparents' farmland in Wisconsin. We visited often because they only lived a couple hours away from us, and we would typically spend the weekend. My grandfather had retired from farming, but he still kept some cows and rented out his fields to a younger local farmer, who grew corn there most years. The remaining land is woodland. We often went on hikes to look for deer or other wildlife, and to just see the beautiful country which I, as having grown up in the city, craved. One thing that my grandfather, his relatives, and eventually me also used the land for was hunting. The land, full of thick forests and corn fields all around, was ideal for hunting deer. My grandfather had hunted deer on that land his entire life, and he had always wanted me to hunt there once I was old enough as well. Eventually, of course, I did and this story would not exist if I hadn't. And God, do I wish I hadn't. I started hunting when I was 13. There was a particular weekend set aside for youth hunters before the main season began. That year, I was set up in an old, broken down wagon that watched over a grass field surrounded by trees on all sides. That day, we hadn't seen any deer until the sun had started to set. That was when I saw the first deer I would ever shoot. It was such an exciting experience and getting a deer felt so satisfying. Also, it was a way I had been able to bond with my father and grandfather and I felt I had made them proud. I got to do something they had done their entire lives. The next couple years were of similar experience. I hadn't had a reason to stop hunting. I loved it. My feelings and excitement towards hunting were quickly killed off after what I experienced during one hunting season. 
I was about 16, and by this time, I was too old to participate in the youth hunt weekend. I now had to hunt during the same time as everyone else, in the frigid cold middle of November. My grandfather's brothers all hunted on the same land, and there was a sort of agreement that everyone who had hunted the land would take a share of the meat from the deer that anyone got. Everyone also had their sort of designated stands, or places they would stay at during the day. We shifted around sometimes, but on this particular day, I ended up back in the wagon stand I had been in previous years. I hadn't seen a single deer all day and sitting around, freezing my ass off really killed the thrill of it all. I heard gunshots on and off all day, mostly very distant ones. As the day approached nightfall, a crack broke through the frozen air. It came from somewhere in front of me, past the field and woods I was watching over all day. It wasn't far. It must have been on my grandfather's land, and I knew both my grandfather and my father were set up in their own stands in that direction. Between me and them was a trial that went through the woods and opened up in another field. I had hoped it was one of them who had been able to get their deer and I was excited at the thought, as we hadn't been having very much luck this year. Not long after, only a few minutes or so, a doe jumped out from the tree lean and dashed quickly across my field. It must have been running from the shot I had just heard, either along with the deer they had shot or having been spooked by the noise. I didn't shoot this one. I was after a buck and I wasn't going to waste my shot on a target moving so fast. I hunkered down and waited to see if a buck would come out before nightfall. I was much more on edge and excited at the possibility now. I had heard a very close gunshot and finally seen a deer. Unfortunately, my buck never came, and I was left empty-handed. Disappointed, I gathered my things climbed out of the wagon and made the long cold walk back through the darkness. I had to take the cow's path from the pasture up to the bar that sat across from my grandparents' house. This required walking on mud and manure that was luckily frosted over and too hard for me to sink into. I eventually made it back to see my grandfather and father outside. They were hooking up a small trailer to a four-wheeler. We exchanged our accounts of how our hunting went and I told my dad that all I had seen was the single doe from a while earlier. He let me know my grandfather was the one who fired the shot earlier and had gotten himself a nice buck. However, it ran far and they had spent hours tracking it. He said that they did find it, and he asked if I would come with and help pick it up. I was more than happy to help. I was ecstatic for my grandfather who had been able to get himself a buck. I hopped on the trailer with my father and my grandfather drove up around the corner of their driveway to the gravel road. There was no sunlight left at this point and this was the countryside so the dark of night was, truly, dark. The only thing visible was what the lights of the four-wheeler unveiled. After a couple minutes on the road, we took a left onto a trail through the woods. We kept on this trail for a while. I don't remember how long exactly, but I remember thinking of how deep in the woods we must have been with each tree we passed and each new shadow the headlights cast into the forest beyond. Eventually got to where they had left the deer. It was nice. I remember that much. A good-sized buck with eight or ten points. I congratulated my grandfather. I got closer and something was very off to me, where the deer had a bullet wound. It was shot straight through the heart, a textbook shot. If you have ever hunted deer, you know that the heart is what you always aim for if possible. A deer can't get far without a working heart, just as you or I. Somehow this thing was able to run an extraordinary distance after my grandfather had shot it so perfectly. It was from a .270 Winchester round, and one specifically made for hunting as well. This didn't make any sense to me, since they had already gutted it and brought it to the trail. All we had to do was load it up and bring it back to be stripped for meat. My grandfather took it to his brother's house which was closer to that trail, and where they were already cleaning up a deer someone else had shot that day. 
I was expecting to be given a task related to collecting the meat, such as labeling bags and bagging up the meat or something of the sorts, but my father had something else he needed me to do. My father told me he had forgotten his bag with his binoculars, ammo, and some other items when he had left his stand to assist my grandfather in tracking down the deer he had shot earlier. I knew what stand he was in and I told him no problem. I would go grab his bag and be back in no time. I took my father's truck. My father had been set up in a stand on the corner where the massive, already harvested cornfield met the trail through the woods into the much smaller grass field where I had been set up in the wagon stand. It was impossible for me to drive the same way that I used to walk back when the sun had gone down earlier. The truck would have a rough time getting down the manure-covered trail I had taken to get back and even then, it couldn't get into the grass field or the trail after so I could get to the stand. I had to drive around the roads to the opposite side of the massy cornfield and walk my way through it until I got to his stand. I hadn't driven my father's truck before, so just the trip on the gravel roads was nerve-wracking enough. Once I had gotten around and saw the opening for the truck to pull in, I drove up so the headlights of the truck pointed straight ahead at the field. I realized I had greatly underestimated the size of the field. Leaving the headlights of the truck on to light up the field to at least some degree, I stepped out and began my very, very long walk across the field. Given the brutal weather turned even colder with the sun down, I was still bundled head to toe. I want to mention this detail because along with the snow, my mobility was quite restricted and I could only walk so fast. I knew that there were bears in this neck of the woods, made evident by the trail camera my grandparents had. I believe I was well within reason to still be carrying a rifle with me as I set out to retrieve my father's back. It was an old .30 semi-automatic carbine from World War II. Not the most powerful or accurate rifle, but I figured it would be the nicest to have if I needed to defend myself from something. I kept it slung around the front of me, using my right to hold it close and keep it from bouncing around and my left hand held a flashlight. I watched just about every other step as I had to traverse over little nubs of what was left of the stalks of corn that had previously populated the field. I alternated my view from the ground in front of me to the field and trees far ahead of me. The headlights from the truck cast a shadow from the remains of every stalk in the field and the trees beyond, leaving a million shadows cast on the field, pointed towards the woods. Even though I had lit the field nicely for myself, it still felt far too dark for my comfort. The closer I got, the more I felt my ridiculous paranoia clouding my mind with random thoughts. I felt as though a wolf would come from the woods, flank around me, and attack me from the side. I actually stopped in my tracks and panned around to look for something in the field to be moving towards me. I did this a few times on my way to the stand. Each time, there was nothing. It was completely a logical fear that made me look in the first place. I had no clue what was getting to me, but it only got worse the longer I was out there. I chalked it up to it being late, dark, and me being alone in an empty field and the vast forest in front of me. Who wouldn't have some offsetting fears or imaginations? I found myself walking faster, stubbing the front of my boots into the ends of the corn stalks. I told myself that the faster I get the bag and get back, the sooner I'll be relaxing in front of the television in my grandparents' house and eating a nice warm meal. No matter what I told myself, the paranoia didn't stop. The scene before me combined with the cold weather surely didn't help, but neither did the dead silence in this field. Everything felt so dead out there. I couldn't hear anything but the snow beneath me as my boots as I took each step, not so little as a gust of wind accompanied me. As I took another step, I could feel my foot pushed right back up as something moved beneath it quickly. The snow from the ground blew up like a landmine and something sprung from the ground. I shrieked like a child and jumped back, nearly tripping over the broken stalks behind me as I did so. 
a rapid fluttering noise came from whatever it was that had risen from the snow. My paranoia felt horrifyingly justified, but only for a moment as I quickly saw what it really was. A bird. What made me think I was being attacked by some monster in the snow was just a bird. What the hell was it doing? What type of bird burrows in a corn field in the middle of winter like this? I calmed myself and began walking again, letting a brief laugh at myself before once again, the paranoia settled back in. More images crowded my head. An angry bear charging out of the woods to maul me to death. Some sort of weird serial killer stalking me from the trees before coming out to chop me up. As quickly as I could shake these ridiculous scenarios I was making up left and right in my head. I could not dismiss the feeling of eyes. The feeling like something was watching me felt all too real. It could have been anything, an owl, a rabbit, maybe even a deer. The thought that there was probably a creature of some kind watching me out in the woods that lay ahead of me was one that would not leave me. As I approached the stand, I slowed my pace and pointed the flashlight ahead, at the base of the stand and the trail beyond. This is where the reach of the headlights seemed to end. The trail and woods on either side were too dark to see. Nonetheless, I approached the stand. Still, I was cautious of all the terrors I told myself could be hiding in the trees. I approached the makeshift ladder for the stand. The build of it overall was quite nice. A wooden watchtower would be the best way to describe its appearance. It was about 15 to 20 feet tall and had a nice sort of bucket at the top, more than big enough for a couple hunters to sit comfortably for a day. I flung the rifle to my back and clicked off the flashlight before putting it in my left coat pocket, but as I did so, I noticed something on the ground. The snow was depressed, in a round sort of ball shape. I pulled my light back out and clicked it on. I thought I could tell what I saw looking at but in my head. I told myself I must be confused. I was only more confused when I clicked the flashlight back on. This mark in the snow resembled a deer track, but it couldn't have been. At least that's what I told myself at the time. It wasn't possible. I was standing beside it, but rotated my left foot to be parallel. This thing was nearly as long as my boot. Impossible. Was there a moose in these woods? It was definitely possible, however. Extremely unlikely. Was the track from a moose even this large? As one can imagine, this only heightened my paranoia. I quickly glanced around me to see if by some off chance whatever left that was still nearby. Again, I hadn't seen a thing. I put the flashlight back in my pocket and made my way up the ladder. Sure enough, my dad's bag was sitting right at the top. I climbed my way up and into the little nest. I wanted to make sure he didn't leave anything else lying around because there was no way in hell I would bring myself to make another trip out here tonight. There wasn't anything, so I zipped up the bag and slung it around my left shoulder, adjusting to make sure I could still get the gun around to my front and that nothing was tangled. I felt some sense of relief wash over me as the trip was half over. I just had to get back now. Being up in the stand gave me a sense of safety something I wanted to hold on to. This made it hard to leave, but again I told myself it was just best to get this over with. I carefully swung myself around and got a good foothold on the top rung of the ladder and lowered myself to make the descent. It was then that I first heard it. A hysterical laugh burst out from behind me. I became as stiff as a board before quickly collapsing back into the stand from the ladder rolling around to look behind me. My heart felt as though it would break through my ribs as I began hyperventilating. Wide-eyed and rifle raised. I looked around on the ground below to see who the hell made that noise. The laughing, which had felt close already, I now realized was far off but approaching. Somewhere to the right, out in front of the stand and in the woods. I ducked beneath the boards of the stand, so I could just barely see above them to the trail on the right. 
What broke from the tree line made my panicking heart shut down and sink into my chest. Emerging first was the blue and red hat, one of those jester-looking ones. The upper body was covered in a blue and red striped outfit, torn at the ends of the sleeves and at the legs. A clown. The detail that chilled me the most was its legs. The legs of a deer. It had to have been no less than twenty feet tall, and yet it was frightfully quiet. It didn't make a loud crunch in the snow as it passed, it didn't break any tree branches, and despite its immense size, it didn't shake the ground as it ran. This immense abomination was able to move dreadfully quiet. The only thing that made its presence apparent was the giggle it couldn't seem to stop. It darted across the trail and into the dark woods beyond. I couldn't make out its face because of the distance between us. I sunk into the stand, with the rifle now clutched and held tight as I tried to wrap my head around what I had just seen. Why? Oh God, why a clown? I hated clowns. They absolutely terrify me. Why here? In the woods? In the middle of the night in November? This wasn't possible. It had to be some sort of nightmare, I assured myself, but I was awake. This was real. All I could do was sit still and try to make sense of it. I had to have sat in silence for ten minutes, wishing I were dead rather than there, with whatever this monster was. I covered my mouth so as to not scream. I was in complete shock and panic. Soon enough I heard it coming back, from somewhere straight behind me, the same laugh from off in the distance, becoming louder as it approached. I sank into the stand, laying flat and praying it wouldn't come to me. It slowed its laugh, each chuckle slower than the last before it let out one. Extraordinarily loud final bellow that echoed through the woods before it fell silent. I knew it had to still be there, and that it was coming but I didn't expect how fast it did. Across from me was a gap with the ladder. In only a split second, I saw its massive hand, if you can call it that, reach up and grip around a tree from across the path. A long, coal black hand with nails more closely resembling uneven claws. It stopped moving. What was it looking at? I heard a softer grunt before the hand moved away, and I could hear the snow crunch as it shuffled to my left, out into the field. I heard another short giggle come from the field. I slowly got onto my knees and shuffled in the stand to the edge where I could poke my head over and see. I saw it, standing still in the field, staring at the headlights of the truck, just like a deer might be caught in them. I could also see the thing in better lighting now. Getting a look only made it worse. I saw a massive cloud of breath escaping its lungs, lit up by the light from the truck. Its head bobbed up and down as its chest filled with air and excreted it. The legs remained still, as if they were rooted in the ground. The arms were massive as well. Despite the height of the creature, they hung low. It just stood there for a few minutes and I was left in awe. I noticed there were other deer in the field. About four does, a few fawns and a smaller buck had all walked onto the field with this thing. They carefully observed the truck and headlights, but didn't seem to have any sort of fear towards this horrendous creature standing among them. The deer acted as if it didn't exist, as if it wasn't a threat or was just one of them. It again started laughing with an impossibly deep voice. This still didn't phase the other deer. It turned and started barreling towards the path again. I quickly ducked and waited for it to pass. This time it didn't turn into the woods and kept on down the path. I laid back down. I was so shaken and afraid I again had to cover my mouth and use all the energy I had to muffle my uncontrollable whimpers. The tears running down my face felt freezing. I had to think of a way to get out of here, but how? That thing could swing back around at any moment, and who the hell knows what it would do if it caught me in the open field. I sat head hung and eyes closed until I could calm myself to composure and contemplated my options. 
It seems to like the trails and open fields, and I figured it had to be too large to be able to traverse through thick forest quickly. I needed to take my chances through the woods. I could stick with them all the way to my grandparents' house, but it was going to be a long walk. Or, I could stay where I was. I concluded that this was not an option. Of how much I had seen it already and given that it was tall enough to just look into the stand if it felt curious, staying wasn't safe. I like this area too much. I made a plan to move once I was calm enough to get down the ladder safely. I thought I ought to sit like I was until then. What felt like moments later I heard leaves crunch from below. I snapped my head up. I felt drowsy. Had I fallen asleep? Yes, somehow I had. I quickly regained my wakefulness after I reminded myself of the situation I was in. I popped my head back over the edge again to get a quick look. As I was up, I felt something push against the back of my neck, like a light gust of wind. I saw the air come from the sides of my head. It was warm, like a breath. I snapped around and found myself face to face with the monster. It had its demonic hands gripping the corners of the stand and was peering right into it, right at me. I could finally see its wretched face. Wrinkly, crusted skin covered in pale white makeup. A long, bright red nose, the shape of a human's but far too large. Eyes black and bright yellow just like a deer. The face looked like it was constructed in the pits of hell and let loose into the world above. The second it realized I was looking back, its smile widened inhumanly wide and its cheeks rose out of twisted excitement. With a row of shining white, sharp teeth and a disgusting black liquid dripping out of its mouth, it began laughing sadistically again, and yet neither the mouth nor the throat seemed to show any movement. I screamed but reacted quickly. I brought the rifle to my shoulder and popped off around right at its head. The shot cracked through the night as I sat up quickly from the boards I had been resting on. Still in the stand, still sitting. I took a glove off and lightly touched the barrel of my rifle, realizing it wasn't warm. I had not actually shot. None of that had happened. Relieved as I was and hopeful that it was all a vivid nightmare. I was quickly disappointed. The laugh boomed through the woods again. This time its voice sounded as if it was fragmented into many others. It sounded as if a choir of demons were laughing in sync with each other before a deep, booming voice from the distance spoke. Did I scare you, boy? Followed by another round of laughter. I had to move now. I retrieved my things and quickly made my way out of the stand, allowing myself to fall the last six feet. Picking myself up quickly... I took off into the woods across the trail. I dashed through the trees as quickly as I could, rifle still in hand. I heard the laughter emerge in the trail again behind me. It had reached the stand already. It let it another shrieking bellow into the night, this one much longer and louder than before. It was angry. Even with the distance I had put between myself and it, my ears were in pain after hearing it. I kept on running through the woods, I was surely dead at this point. That thing would find a way to get to me no matter how deep in the woods I ran. I cleared my head of these doubts and focused on just running, my only chance. To my misfortune, it caught up quite fast. No more than a few minutes after I had left the stand and it was on my tail. I didn't hear it sooner because it was as quiet as a deer might be running through the woods would. When it got close, it couldn't contain its excitement and broke out into another fit of laughter as it clawed at the trees, pushing them aside to catch up. I knew my rifle couldn't do much to this thing but I had to try. I couldn't see a thing in the darkness but I turned and started popping off rounds at its chest, the most obvious and hard-to-miss target I could pick. It was still a good 30 or 40 feet behind me, and there were a lot of trees between us. It didn't seem to have an effect. I turned and kept on for about 30 seconds before I was reminded that I couldn't outrun it, 
and it was even closer now. I turned a corner and twisted to get a line of sight as I realized it had closed the distance between us. It tripped on something and fell, its upper body hanging on a big tree right above me with its right arm and head locked between a branch and the trunk. It reached out with its right arm. I jumped back trying to escape the grab, but I failed. Its hand fit around my entire torso as it jerked me up towards its face. The head was shaking like an angry dog as it opened its mouth wide again. I could see the hate in its eyes. For whatever reason, maybe a desperate last-minute measure, I clicked on my flashlight and pointed it at this monster's eyes. It tilted its head away in a fast jerk to escape the light of my flashlight. Given this momentary opportunity, I raised the rifle still in my right arm and popped a few more shots off, this time at its head. I was tossed to the ground as it reacted. It fell from the tree and let out a loud, painful cry while covering its face with its hands. This made my ears feel as if they were about to explode. I picked myself back up and took off as fast as I could once again. I heard it get up, now crying and screaming in a more human voice as it ran off into the night once again. I just ran as fast as I could and for as long as I could muster, and you best believe I made a good distance running off of that much adrenaline. I only became more excited when I saw lights. They appear to be some sort of yellow light, like that from headlights on a four-wheeler or car, and I hope that's what they were. I picked up my past, but then stopped myself in my tracks. When I got close enough to get a clear visual on the light source, my hope turned to even more dreadful confusion. I saw a tint. A tint like you might expect to see from an old carnival. It was striped black and white, up and down. It was round and came to a little point at the top. The lights had been strung all along the edges, at the top of the frame. Bright yellow light bulbs, each one. In order, shut off every so often and turn back on to give that sort of illusion that a ball was rolling through them. What made even less sense was the ground it sat on. There was a circular patch of perfectly green, even grass around the whole thing. There was not a single tree in this perfect little grassy disc out in the middle of the woods. I stepped onto the grass cautiously. I don't know why I had such curiosity after having just escaped a monstrous abomination, but it didn't stop me from wanting to check out this tent. I approached the tent, and then walked around to try, and see if it had some sort of entrance. As I was coming around, I saw a huge beam of the same yellow light escaping what I thought had to be the entrance. Right when I was about to go up and open it, I faintly heard the cries coming from the woods again. I jumped back into the trees and got low to the ground. I knew now that there was no outrunning this thing so I ought to wait and let it pass. Eventually it broke out of the trees and into the grass area right before me. Still gripping one hand over its face, it pulled open the entrance to the tent, unleashing a huge flash of light into the night. It climbed head first until it was miraculously all the way inside. I just sat in silence and kept a close eye on the tent. After it had gone in, I didn't hear any noises from the creature anymore. No cries, screams, horrid laughter, or speaking. After a few minutes, the light bulbs on the tent shut off one by one, and the light coming from inside faded until it was gone. I still laid there for another few minutes, left confused yet again. Slowly, I climbed to my feet and started walking through the woods once again. I kept a more slow and steady pace. I wasn't sure if this was over or if running was even the best option at this point, so I just stuck with my slow, steady and quiet walk. Soon enough I found a road and followed it until I found my grandparents' place again. My grandmother was the only one there. She let me know my father and grandfather had gone out to look for me. I called up my father who, by some miracle, had a connection out there. I told him to get back. I had a long drawn out screaming match to tell them to get out of there as quickly as possible, but I wasn't listened to. 
Luckily they came back, perfectly fine but having seen nothing. That night I tried to tell the truth, and tell it as straight as possible to my family, and they didn't have much to say in return. I'm sure some of them felt I was losing my mind, and I suppose that conclusion would make sense. I was assured that if that tent was there, and if there were any tracks left, we would see it in the morning. I didn't sleep that night for any number of reasons you might imagine. Despite having gone through what I had, I wanted to go back and find everything and prove I wasn't crazy because the longer I thought about it, the less sense it all made. Maybe I did lose my mind. The next day we all went out and found absolutely no remnants of the creature and no mysterious tint or the plot of grass it sat on. I don't believe I'll go hiking out on that land anymore, or maybe in any woods. I certainly don't think I will ever hunt again. I have a profound fear of the forest at night that I have yet to shake. For a while I believed I was insane, but as I write this I realize I can't be. I did shoot my gun that night, we found the brass. I was picked up by that thing. Everything about that night is still vivid in my memory. I saw everything so clearly and I will never forget it. I don't know if that thing has a tie to that land in Wisconsin or if it resides in other woods or maybe it isn't bound to any forest. Maybe a time? Another condition of some sort? I am looking for answers but I have failed to find any that make any sense. If anyone has ever seen or heard of anything like this I need to know. Fourth story. The Wendigo story. I'm not entirely sure if this was a Wendigo, or what I just usually refer to this as that since this took place not far from an Indian reservation in upstate New York. A few years ago, 2012 or 2013 I think since I was still in high school then, I was at a party with some friends and as the night goes on, maybe 11 to 12 at night one of my friends and I go outside to have a cigarette. The second we get outside there's just this completely awful foul smell. Like just blood, vomit, piss, and death all at once. Now this was somewhat the middle of nowhere so we just figured it was a dead animal and went on with having that cigarette. Less than a minute later we hear something moving in the dark and sure enough, a deer comes hobbling into the very edge of the porch light. So we just mention, ah how cute, and the like. But then I noticed something, one of its front legs was messed up in some way. And I'm talking like broken in multiple places messed up. So my friend and I are slightly off put by this, less than we should have been since drunk, and finish up our sig and go to head inside. However, right as we start to do that, one of the two porch lights goes pop and goes out. So now it's less light outside and this deer is back into the darkness. So, a bit giddily, we both do this like fake scared squeal at each other and turn around to go inside. And that's when we heard it. That undeniable sound of nails on the concrete patio. We both slowly turn around to see this hunched over, rotten coyote doing this very slow, very unnatural crawl towards us. We go from zero, 600 paralyzed with fear almost instantly until another one of our friends playfully pulls us through the open door telling us to get back to the party. To this day, I have not experienced anything like that and it's one of the most horrifying things I've ever experienced. Fifth story. Never swerve to miss a deer. You could hit something much worse. It was one of those nights. The fog hovered in the air like a curtain waiting to rise on a show I would never forget. Being called in to work early on three hours of sleep was bad enough. Driving through the fog that was so thick you can feel it holding back the car makes for an interesting morning. Maybe listening to Metallica's All Nightmare Long at 3 a.m. wasn't the best choice. It started with the floating legs. As I drove, I saw a pair of blue jeans standing along the side of the road, just the legs. It was like someone had stood half a mannequin beside the road to freak people out. As I came closer, I could see there was a black hoodie on top of them in a vaguely human form. The head turned toward me, but I could see nothing inside the hood. 
The chill went up my spine as my foot went down on the accelerator. I was so freaked out that I never saw the deer running straight toward me. It wasn't until it was right beside my car that I noticed it. It startled me so badly that I swerved to miss it and ended up on a side road I'd never driven on or even seen before. I hadn't gone far before I calmed down and realized I had made a wrong turn. I stopped in front of a road sign that mesmerized me. It had once been a standard deer crossing sign, the one with the silhouetted buck leaping in the air. However, this one had been modified by a talented artist. The painted additions made the deer enormous, bigger than a moose. It also had a mouthful of shark-like teeth, a spiked tail, and glowing red eyes. The sight of this fanciful creature should have made me laugh, but after the morning I'd already had, it chilled me to the bone. I immediately did a three-point turn and floored it. I made it maybe a hundred yards. My front tire, which wasn't in the greatest shape, gave in to the stress and had a catastrophic blowout. This, plus my speed, sent me careening off the road and into a deep ravine. At least that's where I woke up, in a deep ravine. I willed my blurry eyes to clear and was immediately sorry I had. Every window was shattered. Tree limbs shot this way and that all through the car's interior. It looked like the love child of an Int and a Buick. My seatbelt held me fast, and the deflated airbag laid out before me like a miniature blanket of snow. I leaned forward and was twice rewarded, the first by pain. My chest and arms felt like they were on fire. The second was the realization that I wasn't on the ground. The car creaked and groaned when I moved. It stood straight up, resting precariously on a large tree limb. I couldn't see how far it was to the bottom because of the same fog that got me into this predicament. Okay, this is bad. I can't even hope for help. No one would ever see me down here. To keep me calm, I did some physical assessments, starting at the feet. Toes wiggle, that's good. Right leg bends, left leg oh my god. I'm gonna call feeling like I've been stabbed by a thousand knives, bad. I leaned forward just enough to see my leg. My pants were covered in blood. I tried to reach the wound but stopped when the branch made a cracking sound. Okay, we'll come back to that. Moving on, my lower abdomen seems okay. My ribs feel like they're the main course at a bar BK. And my arms shoot daggers every time I try to move them. The most disturbing part of all this is the lack of blood on my shirt. Okay. End assessment, possible broken leg, possible broken ribs, possible internal bleeding, car destroyed, hanging precariously in a tree that could give out and send me falling to my death at any minute. Low possibility of rescue due to the early morning hour, fog, and being out of sight of the road. So, essentially, I'm dead. The worst part of all of this was being alone with my thoughts knowing that death was on its way, and there was nothing I could do about it. All these thoughts disappeared as a slight breeze made the hair on my neck stand on end, and I heard a low rumble. I slowly turned to face the noise and wondered if I was hallucinating. I saw two huge red orbs coming steadily towards me out of the fog. As they approached I could see they were attached to a monstrosity. The creature stopped right beside the car. The artist on the sign didn't do it justice. My breathing became rapid and shallow as my heart jackhammered in my chest. A warm liquid ran down my leg that had nothing to do with the car. Its glowing red eyes were the size of basketballs. Its teeth looked like they came straight out of the shark from Jaws. Its claws were as long as hunting knives. I stifled a scream as my injuries were forgotten. The huge red eyes were so close I could feel the warmth coming off of them. It stared at me. Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't think. It ripped the door off the car and inhaled as if sniffing me. Oh me god me god me god me god me god. It backed out then grabbed the car 
and shook it out of the tree until it toppled over onto its roof. God damn. The roof collapsed from the weight and missed crushing my head by mere inches. I nearly lost consciousness from the agonizing pain as I hung upside from my seatbelt strapped across my broken ribs. The car began to move. Metal protested as it was dragged through the woods. Oh no, it's taking me back to its cave. I tried to reach the seatbelt release, but the pain was too great. I was being dragged helplessly to my death. For what seemed like an eternity this ride from hell taught me the meaning of pain. Every bump and jostle was a new lesson. The metal screeched in protest as the car finally stopped. The creature sniffed me again. Go ahead. Eat me. I screamed. I hope I give you indigestion. The red orbs stared at me as if sizing me up to see if it would be enough trouble to rip me out of the car. In desperation, I used the only thing I had available to me. I reached up painfully and pressed the horn. The creature jumped and screamed a horribly loud cry that defied description. The last thing I remember seeing was it running off into the trees as my mind led me into blissful unconsciousness. Beep, beep, beep. All right, I'm up already. I reached for my alarm clock, but it wasn't there. In fact, my bedroom wasn't there either. I woke to incessant beeps pounding my aching head. I looked around the white room at the machines that kept me alive. My eyes settled on the man in uniform standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. Good morning, he said. Good morning, I rasped back. My name's Sheriff Seacrest. I realize this isn't the best time, but I need to ask you a few questions about your accident. Okay. From the skid marks on the road, I figured you were doing at least 80 when your tire blew. Any reason you were going that fast? Am I under arrest? The sheriff studied me for a moment. No, you're not under arrest. I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I was scared, I said barely above a whisper. Scared of what? Of whatever was in the fog. So, what was in the fog? I laid quiet for a long time. I wrestled with the implications of telling someone else what I saw. I wasn't even sure myself. My imagination. The sheriff seemed a little disappointed. So how did your car get out of the tree, dragged a hundred yards, and set on the side of a road? I don't know, sheriff. I wish I had the answers for you. But I blacked out when I landed in that tree and woke up here. And that's all you remember? Yes, sir. Was there any wildlife around? W, what do you mean, wildlife? Oh, you know, squirrels, foxes, deer, he said, emphasizing the last word. And nothing that I saw as I said. I blacked out. He closed his notebook. Thank you for your help. I hope you recover soon. I hope so too. The sheriff started for the door, stopped, turned back, and looked into my eyes as if he desperately wanted to say something, then faltered and said, you're very lucky to be alive. I know.